Hi, I'm Katie. Um, I'm a software engineer at Venmo in New York. Is this all right? I hear it sound really loud to myself. All right, cool. Um, and I'm a Recurse Center alum from fall 2013. Um, this is me on all the things, um, GitHub, Twitter, my technical blog, which is on Tumblr for some reason. Um, and today I'm here to talk a little bit about a project that I've been working on, which is a framework for writing and running text adventure games. Um, so text adventure is a game that has text-only input and text-only output, and everyone was surprised. Um, there's a slew of classic ones from the 70s and 80s, like Colossal Cave Adventure, which is what I grew up playing, and Zork. Um, and there's a system for writing text adventures slash interactive fiction called Inform 7, which is really cool in that it reads a lot like English. Um, so if you've never played a text adventure, I would highly recommend it. Um, and so the whole reason that we're here today is because a couple years ago, I decided that I was going to write a Harry Potter game, a Harry Potter themed text adventure game in Python. So first of all, first of all let's uh, just take a quick look at how a text adventure works. And I'm going to use my game as an example, because I know it best. Um, so this is a bit in my Harry Potter game. And when you play a text adventure, there are some things that you'll notice. So first of all, the game has state. Um, so in this bit in my Harry Potter game, you'll notice that there is a room. Um, and the room contains a cat. The room contains a filing cabinet. The cat is alive. Um, there is a thing called a player. And the player is in Filch's office. Um, so all of these things are stateful. And the state can change. So the player might not always be in Filch's office. The cat might not always be alive. But there are rules about how the state can change. So if you try and pick up the cat, you would change the cat's state from like being in the room to being in your possession. And the game doesn't let you do that. But a few lines later, if you try and pick up the invisibility cloak, you can. And so you're changing the cloak's state from being in the room to being in your possession slash inventory. Um, if you've ever played a Twine game or another choose your own adventure game, then you might already be familiar with this kind of state machine setup. Um, and the difference between a choose your own adventure and a text adventure is that in a choose your own adventure, you have, at any given point, you have a limited set of state changes that you can do. Um, and in a text adventure, you're not at all limited at the input that you can give the game. Um, so that means that the game has a little bit more work to do. So let's just take what I said and condense that into like a flowchart of what the game's actually doing. Um, so when you type some input, the game A has to figure out what the heck you're talking about, um, by which I mean like take your raw input and parse it into some instructions, um, ships that off to some logic, which determines if you can actually do the thing that the parser thinks you want to do. Um, and then the logic talks to the game state, tells the game state if and how it should change. And finally, reports back to the player. Um, let's talk about state briefly. Um, so for my text adventure game, I chose to implement three types of stateful, stateful things. Um, and I had rooms, things, and players. Uh, so rooms are things like Filch's office. And they have descriptions, like you're in a small, spotless room, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they can connect to other rooms. They have inventories. They can contain things. Um, things like the cat, like the filing cabinet, have a description. They can contain things. They might have an inventory. They might be alive, like the cat. They might be edible. There's like a lot of things, um, a lot of properties that things can have. And players have locations, have inventories. In a Harry Potter game, they're going to have a house. And the entire state of Hogwarts is represented by the collected state of all the rooms and the things and the players in the game. So why did I do this? And the short answer is it's easier. So imagine that we're in Filch's office before I try and pick up the cat. The state at the game at that point is this giant collection of, well, the player is in Filch's office. The cat is in Filch's office. Um, the player is holding the wand, but not the cat, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because Hogwarts is a big place, and there are lots of things in it. 
Um, yeah. So not going. Have yeah, like um, like the filing cabinet is a thing, um, and in when you first walk into Filch's office, the invisibility cloak is in the filing cabinet. Um, yeah, I have thoughts about how to do different types of things if you wanna, like if we have time after. Um, and so, so say you don't split the state up, and uh, when you're trying to pick up the cat, then the game has to term, determine if you can go from this giant state ball that does not have the cat in your inventory to the same giant state ball with the only change being the cat being in your inventory. So for the game, that's really easy because all it has to do is look up in a table, oh, here's state A, here's state B, is there a link between them? It's really easy for the game. Um, but for the game maker to do that, the game maker would have to generate a complete list of states and a complete list of allowed transitions between states. And if you're, playing a, if you're writing a text adventure where there are so many possible things that you could do at any given time, that's a total nightmare. Um, so that's why I split my state up. Uh, and now, how does the game decide if you can take the cat? Um, so in a word, the game uses logic. So instead of me having to write out all the possible situations in which I could pick up the cat, um, instead I write out all the conditions that would have to be true for the player to be allowed to pick up the cat. So like, maybe the cat needs to be feeling sociable for you to be able to pick up the cat. Um, the cat needs to be not asleep, or maybe asleep. Maybe it's easier to pick up the cat when the cat is asleep. I don't know. Um, but there are some rules for when you would be able to take the cat. Um, and so once, once the parser takes your user input and processes it into something that it wants the game logic to do, um, the logic handler just calls the appropriate command, <laughs> read function, um, which takes the argument that the parser gives it run some logic and tries to do that thing. Um, so like bringing it back to the flowchart, um, this is the way my text adventure worked. Um, I have a parser, parser talks to the logic handler, the logic handler calls the appropriate command with the other arguments um, from your input and then the command runs some if statements, talks to the state, figures out if you can do what it thinks you want to do, um, and finally delivers a response to you. Um, so in my Go West Young Man example, um, the parser would presumably think that Go West Young Man means that you want to go west. Um, it would call the Go command with the argument west, um, and the Go command would check if you are in a room that has an exit to the west, and if you are, it'll move you there and uh, tell you something about the new place that you're in. Um, so this is an example of general, generalization improving UX. Right? So to make it easier for me as the game maker to set and regulate game state, I split the game state up into easily digestible chunks, and I use commands, cough, functions, with logic, cough, if statements, to determine whether the requested change can happen. Um, so I wrote a text adventure that had that flow and it worked, it ran. You could go in Filch's office, you could get an invisibility cloak, you couldn't play with the cat, um, but who wants to play with that cat anyway? Um, and so if that works, and it mostly does, keyword mostly, I have some bug stories ahead, um, if that works, then why would we bother with making a text adventure framework? And the short answer is because I wanna be able to write more than one text adventure game in my life. I really like working on my Harry Potter game, but it's not inconceivable that sooner or later I'm going to want to make another game. Um, so with the code that I had for my text adventure game, I could in theory make a map of entirely new rooms um, and I could make entirely new objects and entirely new players. So for the Firefly universe, I could, um, well, I'd probably make Serenity a couple of rooms, um, but you could, in theory, make a map that, is, that has a spot outside the ship and then several rooms inside the ship. Um, 
And what else would you want? You'd want to make a player that was Kaylee and she mostly hung out in the engine room, stuff like that. Like I could, I could make a map that represents the Firefly universe. Um, but I wouldn't be able to reuse any of the logic code because the logic code that I have for my text adventure game tries to do things like turn all the lights in a room on if you type Lumos. Um, and I don't want that in a Firefly game. So if I want to make more than one text adventure, I'm going to need a system that will not only allow me to use or not use rooms, like Filch's office, um, but will also allow me to use or not use logic. Um, for example, when to release the Sword of Gryffindor. So <laughs> you've been very patient with me so far. Here's a bug. Um, let's just take a minute and talk about the Sword of Gryffindor. A lot of text adventures have a command called examine. And usually what examine does is it just prints out a detailed description of, well, the thing that you're examining. Um, so in a Harry Potter game, if you examine the sorting hat, then you should reasonably expect to get some detailed description of the sorting hat. Fine. Um, in the Harry Potter universe, if you're in Gryffindor house and you examine the sorting hat, then the sword of Gryffindor falls out of the sorting hat. So obviously I had to implement that. Um, so I added some logic to my examine function. And that logic checked, A, if you're examining the sorting hat, and B, if the player doing the examining is a Gryffindor. And if both of those are true, then I change the output of examine to include some line about the sword. And as a side effect, <laughs> I add the sword to the player's inventory. So doing that results in a lot of Harry Potter specific logic being added to my examine command. Um, it makes the examine command need complex for the sake of this edge case that I'm only ever going to use in this one game. And to cap it all off, it doesn't actually work. So imagine that your sword happens to be Gryffindor. So you find the sorting hat, you take the sorting hat, you examine the sorting hat, you get the sword of Gryffindor, yay. Um, then you examine the hat a second time, and you get a second, the sword of Gryffindor. So <laughs> either there's an arbitrary number of Godric Gryffindors in the world, all of them have swords, all of them are involved with educating British teenagers, <laughs> or there's something wrong here. So the solution that I hit upon was just adding another if statement into examine to check if the sword already exists in the game somewhere. And if it does, then you don't drop the sword. <coughs> so that's a solution to the problem. Um, it's, well, it's a solution to the multiplying sword bug. Um, it's a bad solution because it's adding even more Harry Potter specific logic to this command that I'm going to use in every single other text adventure that I write. Um, so if I write another game, then I'm going to have to rewrite examine, which is not the experience that I want. As a game maker, I want the freedom to write game-specific state, like Filch's office, and game-specific rules, like when to drop the sword of Gryffindor, um, but I don't have to be rewriting code that should be in common with all, my, all of my text adventures. Um, <laughs> I like this quote a lot. So in other words, if I'm writing a Harry Potter game, I should be writing Harry Potter stuff and not text adventure stuff. Um, and that's why I'm writing a text adventure framework. Um, that's what I mean by a text. This is precisely what I mean by a text adventure framework, a program that lets me write and run other programs. Um, so all right, we want to do this. How is that different from just writing a regular game? And Spark notes, it's not all that different. Um, so from the player's perspective, nothing should change. Um, if you're playing a game that is written with my framework, it should look exactly the same as a standalone text adventure. Um, and that means that the same things have to be done with user input as were done before. Um, so 
the, you're still going to need to parse it. You're still going to need to perform some logic. You're still going to need to store some state somewhere. And the difference between a framework and a standalone game is that the engine, by which I mean the set of parser, logic, and state, um, that doesn't have any game data. Um, so to make a functioning game instance, then the engine has to be initialized with the game-specific data, um, the words that the parser has to recognize, the, um, the commands and logic that the logic handler needs to know about, and the specific state like the set of rooms and things that are in the new game. Um, that means that I have two users to think about. First of all, the player user, who we've, we've already taken care of the player. They don't, they don't see anything different. Um, but now we have the game maker user who writes the game metadata and feeds it to the framework engine, producing their game instance. Um, great. So in a nutshell then, the difference between a framework and a game is that for a framework, the challenge becomes abstracting all the game data out of the three major pieces of the engine. Um, the parser, the logic handler, and the state. Um, so let's do it. Let's, let's abstract. Let's abstract all the things. Um, parsers. Uh, so going back a sec, um, the parser's job is to take user input and turn it into an instruction for the logic handler. Um, that means that the only game-specific knowledge that the parser needs is what words it should recognize. Um, and so my game parses things by just having a list of words that it knows. And the words that it knows are commands, things, rooms, players, um, directions, uh, and other words. <laughs> um, the only words that the parser recognizes are words that represent concrete things or concepts in the game. Um, so let's say that I write a Pride and Prejudice themed game. And one of my users types this long thing. Um, so Pride and Prejudice is all about romance, right? So, so first of all, if you look at this, um, I expect that my, my Pride and Prejudice themed game will know about Pemberley, because that's a fair, that's a pretty, it's one of the major plot points. It's a, it's a location in the book. It's, it should know about Pemberley. Um, and let's also assume that my Pride and Prejudice game has a command called date. And maybe the date command takes a player name as an argument. And I don't know what it would do, but like, like conceivably in a Pride and Prejudice themed game, you could type date Darcy or date Lizzie, and the game would do something in return, right? That's something we can, we can imagine. Um, so the parser takes a look at the sentence, and only two words in it represent things or concepts in the game. Date, which the parser knows is a command, and Pemberley, which the parser knows is a place. Um, so the parser just takes those two things and passes that off to the logic handler. And of course, the logic handler thinks that this is a bonkers command, right? Like, date Darcy should do something, date Netherfield, date Pemberley is like, what, what, are, we, what are you trying to do? I don't know. Um, but hey, at least the parser tried. Um, and so, Doing the parsing this way means that abstracting game data out of parsing is just a matter of initialize, like not, you make your parser so that it's initialized with a set of words that it recognizes. Um, so, so to have a parser that is abstractable, you just initialize it with the correct list of words. And then you're done. Unfortunately, yes. Um, hmm. So currently, I'm being naive, and I'm assuming that the first word um, in the thing that you type is the verb, and everything else is a noun. Um, and for the most part, I think that's reasonable. Because like, when, I'm, when I'm playing a text adventure, I usually don't try anything very complex. 
And maybe part of that is because I've written one, and so I know that like it's hard to like process complex human input. Um, but yeah, that's all I'm doing. First word is verb. Um, I have a shortcut, though. So if you type a direction, then it interprets that as go plus the direction, because uh, I'm really lazy. Um, OK, so the logic handler is a little more difficult. Um, and so assuming that we have the same general principle for the logic handler in the framework as we do in the game, meaning logic handler gets some words from the parser, and then it tries and farms that off to the appropriate command, um, assuming that we're keeping that, um, then we have to make commands completely customizable. So for example, in my Harry Potter game, I want Accio to be a command. Sorry, I took Italian. It's Accio. I don't care what they say in the movies. Um, <laughs> but I don't want Accio to exist in like a great American road trip adventure. Also, like some commands you're going to need in every single text adventure. Like you shouldn't have to re-implement Go when you write your text adventure game. But maybe for some text adventures, Go should do something different. Um, so if you're in a road trip adventure, then Presumably, you have a car, and maybe you want go west to move you one unit west if you're not in a car, and go west to move you like 10 units west if you are in a car. Um, so we got to make commands completely modular and customizable. And so I think the first step is deciding what we actually mean by a command. Um, so a command needs to do some sort of syntax checking. So if I type garbage, like go wand, then Go shouldn't do anything. Um, if I type go south, then the command should do some logic checks, right? Like, is there a room to the south? Can I go there? Um, so I distilled, I distilled command responsibilities into like four categories. Um, syntax checks, logic checks, if there's a state change, so like if you can go west, then like move the player location, um, and what response to give to serve back. Um, and so I wrote this command class um, that takes helper functions to handle each of these responsibilities. Um, and then when you call the command, it executes the helper functions in syntax, logic, state change, formulate response order. Um, so, so Go um, becomes this collection of helper functions. And if you want to, um, it's a little bit wordy. But the beautiful thing about it is that if you want to add another condition to Go, you just have to add another helper method and add that to the Go rules. Um, so maybe you're making a game where the players can be stuck in Ublek. And if they're stuck in Ublek, then they can't go anywhere. Well, just write a function that checks if they're stuck in Ublek and add that to the rules for Go. Um, Great. Uh, you made it. We built a framework. Um, so as a little bonus, um, I didn't have this section in my outline before, but now that we have this framework, now that we have customizable commands that, that let us um, like break our logic out of, uh, out of the main engine system, let's do some things with it. Um, so from here on out, it's going to be Harry Potter only. Um, uh, so let's say that you want things to happen at specific points in your text adventure game. So in Harry Potter, there's this monster called the Basilisk. Um, the Basilisk turns people to stone if they look at it. Well, it kills people if they look at it. Um, it turns people to stone if they like look at it through something. Whatever. It doesn't matter. There's a monster. It's called the Basilisk. Um, in your Harry Potter text adventure, you want the basilisk to be released at turn 100. Um, well, in my logic handler, I handily built this little thing that will let you run commands after every user turn. Um, so if you want to release the basilisk at turn 100, then you write a command um, where the rule is you must be at turn 100. And the state change is put the basilisk in the castle. Um, and just add that to the list of like auto commands that are run after every turn. And then on turn 100, it'll put the basilisk in the castle. Um, 
In a similar vein, maybe you want to sort people into houses automatically at a specific point in the game, like after some turn of theirs. Um, so you could do kind of a, the same thing that you did for the basilisk, where you write a command, where the rule is like, you must be at turn 25 or whatever. Um, and the hard part becomes writing a sorting algorithm that can split you into one of the four types of personalities that we know everyone, ha everyone has one of these four personalities. <laughs> Um, so I leave that to you. Write your sorting algorithm. Um, make a function that runs it and then sets, sets the player's house to the result of that sorting algorithm. Um, have it run on turn 25. You're done. Um, and sorting is particularly cool because the player's house attribute influences them at other points in the game. Cough, sort of Gryffindor. Uh, and finally, spells. Um, so if you have a command system that lets you like tack arbitrary rules onto your commands, then implementing spells is just implementing a normal command with the additional rule, you must be carrying your wand in order to do this. Um, and if you really want to be technical about spells, um, maybe you want players to only be able to cast a spell if they like have a particular level of experience casting that spell. They have to practice, in other words. Um, so imagine that you increment an attribute on the player every time they try to cast the spell. Um, and then you can add a rule to your spell that will only let them, only let the state change happen if that attribute is like above a certain level. Cool. That's about, that's all I got. Um, <laughs> if I have a point, uh, I have two points. Um, one, abstraction is your friend. Um, abstraction makes a better UX for everyone, creators and users alike. Um, I haven't actually completely rewritten my game in my framework, but when I do, it will be so much easier than writing it not in my framework was. Um, and on a, more, on a more personal note, um, this is the project that I feel launched my career. Um, this was what I paired on in my Recurse Center interview, and I've been consistently learning from it ever since. Um, so I think, I think my, my greater point is if you have a pet project and you're really excited about it, build it. Um, guaranteed you will learn from it, and you will have fun, and that's it. <laughs>